today on the Cameron Journal podcast, I am joined by a very interesting person. He does uh, he has this wonderful agency where they build products, and his name is very complicated, and I'm not going to butcher it. We'll have him introduce himself in a second. But he is one of these amazing, dynamic people that climbs mountains and fjords, rivers, and does all these sorts of wonderful outdoorsy things that I could never be caught dead doing. Um, and he has a very interesting, interesting background in technology and advertising and products and all this type of thing. So, um, or unlike most of my guests who are here to promote a book, he is not here to promote a book. So we're just going to talk, have an interesting conversation. Um, I recently appeared on his podcast, which talks about um, interesting recommendations. Um, and we went through the official book list, um, which you can uh, read at CameronJournal.com. And so I imagine we'll probably talk about that. And then we'll also uh, go on to other fun subjects. So welcome to the Cameron Journal podcast. Introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Cameron. It is such an honor to be here. And I'm never going to live up to an introduction like that. How am I supposed to how, how am I supposed to fill those shoes? <laughs> <laughs> You've already spoken well, I... too kindly of me. Yes, well, I remember the first time that we 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 chatted. You had a very slick presentation about yourself, like primed and ready to go. Um, which reminds, I should like have that for myself, and I definitely don't. Um, and so it was all it was all rather rather Im impressive. Um, so I would say you've done it to yourself by making okay. an impressive an impressive presentation. So. Uh that's 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 fair. So before that comes off as being too narcissistic on my part, that 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 little presentation was a product of I had recently not not long before we were chatting joined this thing called Lunch Club which is an AI driven meetup where uh, personally, I found after moving to a new location and right before a pandemic, I just completely lost sight of any sort of human connection outside of my family. And thinking back on all the real pivotal moments of my life, they're all about human connections. So a friend told me about this service that I think it digs into your LinkedIn profile and randomly hooks you up with these people where you give them calendar spots uh, just ongoing whenever you have time during the week who have similar interests. And because my background is really strange, and I was just repeating the same story all the time, never knowing what was going to resonate with people. I decided to make a little three-minute pitch about me that was half informational, half entertainment, uh, just to get the conversation started and just had such a good response from that. I started just doing it all the time. And you were you were you were subject to that little thing as well. No, no, I appreciate that. However, I need you to do one thing because the listener is very lost right now. Please state your name for the record because I'm not going to butcher <laughs> absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really wanted you to try, but then that would give me the PTSD of every first day in elementary school when the teacher would completely mangle my name. So it's Elijah Sauce, and that is just like pizza sauce, but it is spelled S Z. A-S-Z, and that's from Hungary, where they like to just throw random consonants in the middle of names to mess people up. Yes, it's, and I always joke about French. French is a language where they want to use all the letters and pronounce almost none of them. Like, right. we're going to throw all the letters, but only say three of them. Like, much more fun. <laughs> Hungarian um, could be worse. It really might be. <laughs> you no, know, I have no doubt that Hungarian is 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 worse. Um it's yes, too many. You, you look at some of that, and you're kind of like, Hungary is a country we need to check on from time to time. We need to schlep down and be like, is everyone down here okay? How's the water? How's the air? Like, you know, it's, uh, I feel the same thing with Australia. Weird things are going on. And from time to time, we should have a global check in. Like, just like some places where we just go and be like, are you guys okay? Do you need anything? How can we help? Because some places need need some need some help from time to time. So. Yeah, I, I don't think it's gotten too much more stable since my father fled there during the revolution in the fifties. It's like it's still it's still a little topsy turvy over there. So I, I totally yeah, agree. Now, now they have Viktor Orban, who's trying to be a dictator, which is just fun. And there's a really beautiful memorial. Fun fact: in Denver, there's a very beautiful memorial to the 1956 Hungarian Revolution in Denver, of all places. In Cherry Creek, it's very large and granite, very dramatic, all this type of thing. Um, and so it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure why they decided to put it 
there like it's like why is this here um perhaps someplace more important you know sort of thing but um yeah so it's like we kind of like lo for us locals who grew up we kind of always knew about it because we had to drive by the big granite thing like oh right. yeah 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 we know about that we have a park we have a park for that like it's <laughs> it's a remembrance yeah yeah okay <laughs> yeah it, yeah it was very it was kind of one of those things that you know you just end up being aware of because someone set up you know a stone and a couple of trees and you know and a statue and you know for a remembrance sort of thing That's so right. yeah it was very odd so well why don't we start from the beginning um why don't you tell us a little about where you're working at now and we'll extrapolate backwards from there yeah, totally. So right now I have a creative agency, but not the kind of creative agency that's doing ads or spending your money on Facebook. We we build product, digital product, stuff that lives on your phone or computer or in the ether in the cloud. And we work with uh, Fortune 500 companies, but also a ton of startups who want to be like the Fortune 500 companies. And that covers everything from interaction design to visual design, visual ID and branding, and then all the full stack engineering services to get it out to market. Uh, inside of that, we have a bunch of dumb ideas from time to time, some dumber than others. But when we feel like they're not too bad, we spin those off after incubating them inside of the agency into a new company. Sometimes raise money for that, sometimes bootstrap it, try to grow those and eventually sell them. And so we've done that a few times over the years. And the latest one that we just spun off into its own company recently is called Vouch. And Vouch is a mobile app that lets you recommend things to your friends and get recommendations from your friends. Kind of like if you thought about your Instagram feed only being the things that your friends found and loved so much, they'd want to share them with you. You can then save them into a little private tri vault and then recommend them to the people who follow you if you love them too. And that's products, services, media, and food. And so that's that's what I'm spending most of my time on right now. Yes. No, I've been experimenting with this app. I was I did it in preparation for doing your show and added some fun things um including the camera i'm using which you talked about before we started recording oh, nice. um yes and a couple books my own because i'm that guy um you could fill your whole vouch vault up with books camera you could uh... yes no i added my own i added jane air i added a, a couple um it was um I, I about died of laughter when we were recording in the official book list um, under politics. One of the first book listed is Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. And right. it was, and I, I just absolutely laughed when you saw something to be kind of like, that's an unusual choice. I'm like, well, actually not really. If you want to under, you know, if you want to understand crazy people, you should read what they write. Um, there's a lot of insight there. Um <laughs> And so, but it, it is okay. very, contra I mean, but I mean, truthfully, people sometimes find that very controversial. I mean, it got, pulled out, it got pulled out of libraries, you know, yes. I mean, it was, it was incredibly controversial. And I, yeah. you, you're the first person I've ever spoken to who's like, yeah, totally. No, I, I read, I read totally Das Kapital in high school and I grew up conservative, Republican, religious fundamentalist. And I, I read, I read Marx in high school, like um, the second, the second like big term paper project I ever did was on Das Kapital and Karl Marx. The first one was on Queen Victoria. So I've I've been about that life for a long time. Really, really trying to make friends with all the teachers, I can say. That was, uh, <laughs> was your goal. <laughs> yeah, especially especially my my English tutor was a very conservative pastor's wife. So when I said I was doing Karl Marx, she, I think she started having heart palpitations. Um, but I I've I've been about that life. Like I I, you know, I go and explore just sort of I kind of go where things take me um I I have very few limits so um it, it's you know when it comes to stuff like that I'm like yeah sure let's find let's find out what this crazy person has said you know yeah. sort of thing it, um it only reminds me of that concept of a steel manning have you heard of that term yes I have yes. yeah right so you're, where you're actually trying to almost through the lens of empathy to an extent, right? Trying to build up the argument of the other side that you don't necessarily believe in. And what better way to really understand somebody's motives than to read their autobiography, right? And I never even thought about that when I think of uh, 
you know, you're like, oh, name a person who is absolutely evil and horrible and <laughs> turned history in a way that was, you know, and I'm like, yeah, everyone, oh, Adolf yeah. Hitler, right? And that book uh, never even occurred to me to read. It was like it, almost like the, the the butt of a joke of like, uh, oh, wow. Uh, oh, there's like a, one of the white elephant Christmas exchanges. Well, I'll just throw Mein Kampf in there and nobody's going to know where it came from and somebody's going to get that. And now I'm yeah. like... I might actually I think I'm going to read that. Now it's going to go on my super deep Kindle queue. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, I, I, yes, I mean, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Mao's Red Book. I think, you know, if you want to understand this stuff, you know, especially given what I do with political commentary, if you want to understand this stuff, these thinkings, these systems, then you have to understand the literature behind it and the thinking behind it. Um, and barring a series of very intimate personal conversations with these people, their book is the best way to get a hold of that. Um, so, yeah, so yes, but your vouch up is very interesting. Let's get enough about me, more about you. Enough, um, about, enough about Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, your 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 vouch up is very is very is very interesting. What is, what is the hardest part about building an app? Uh, getting people to use it that makes sense <laughs> uh, it's yeah. it, you know what and this insight doesn't come from just my own spirit experience doing this over and over again but we work with a ton of people who have very interesting ideas on napkins and they come to us and say what would this look like if it was expressed in screen views and we get that far and then, you know, they maybe raise some money or they bootstrap this thing with credit cards, eventually get it into the engineering stage and are convinced that, oh, wow, this is just so hard to keep this thing uh, through the lens of an agile perspective and keep it lean and get it out fast. And, you know, they're just like grinding, grinding. And then they think they have crossed this arbitrary finish line and the work has just started getting people to use anything these days, no matter if it's free or how compelling the product or service is, is such a struggle because we've now crossed over from this information age into the attention economy. And everything is a fight for attention. And that includes this very limited three inches of real estate that you have on your mobile device that everybody is fighting for. And it's very, very, very tough. And there isn't some silver bullet or the magic influencer, uh, although sometimes that can really help things depending on who that magic influencer might be, but to really have the longevity of getting people to use a product uh, on and on and on and really grow it is incredibly challenging. Yes. No, that, that definitely makes sense. I think that is, um, I think that's true for any sort of 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 product or or service when i worked in television we did um sort of as seen on tv inventor stuff and you would have people who'd spent hundreds of thousands of dollars you know making something plastic molds you know all this type of thing working out manufacturing in china prototypes all this sort of thing and then suddenly there's a hundred thousand of it in their garage and they realize they have no plan to sell the widget. And that's usually where we came in. Um, right. the, yes, the, the chief struggle with that business being they were usually pretty low on cash by that time. Right. <laughs> so you we lost the coffers just to get that thing out the door. And yeah. Then, so yeah. We, we really had to come up with some innovative, um, you know, ways to finance the marketing um, because they had really kind of spent all the money getting the widget to that point. And even with that sort of thing, convincing people to buy something they do not need, you know, really oftentimes they don't know that they need yet, um, right. is a, is a quite difficult, is a quite difficult thing. And that's when it gets into emotional selling, aspirational selling, all this sort of thing. But I, I like that phrase, attention economy, and I've only heard that once or twice before. Attention economy, um, and and fighting for people's a attention. Yeah. It's it's kind of the currency we deal with today. Yeah, in, in these these you know uh, multi billion dollar companies, 
you know, people, I, I, I have this memory of when Facebook first launched their ad platform. And before that you had, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you remember this too. You've been, you've been around for this, you know, you had like fan pages, right? right? And it was this big thing to grow your fan page and you could have a product or your company on your fan page and try to get a bunch of people to follow it. But it, after that, they launched an entire ad platform where it's more of a pay to play to get in front of people. And I remember getting this phone call from my father who, uh, to be fair, you know, I'd also get a phone call for every piece of spam email he got saying like, Hey, there's this Nigerian prince who wants to give me all this money. Do you think this might be real? Right? Like every, every, every single thing he'd kind of like, he'd get hooked with it. And so he, he calls me and he said, I can't, I can't believe this is happening. You see on Facebook getting all these advertisements now, this is absolutely insane. Like, yeah, dad, how do you, how do you, how do you think they make money? How do you, how do you think this, <laughs> you've been using this thing for free for years, right? Like, well, h- how do you think they get paid? He's like, well, I mean, this is, it's just kind of, it's kind of crazy. And uh, like, yeah, uh, you know, anybody who thinks any of these products are free is completely misguided. You, you're, you're, you're the, you're, you're, you're the product. Like you're, you're, you're the thing that, is basically being transacted on. It's your attention, right? And every every time we give something our attention, even if it's free for months or even years, as in the case of Facebook or Instagram, then all of a sudden now it's an ad platform and what's being sold is our attention by the platform to its customers. And that's 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 how that's how the system works, right? And yeah, some of the biggest. Oh no! Companies. I mean that that system has like, been like, has like been Google. brutal right. for those of us in the content business because Google and Facebook have completely sucked up all the advertising dollars. There pretty much are. Um, it's a, it's everyone else, yeah, everyone else is is competing for less than ten percent of the market that they are not eating up. Um, right. <clears throat> and then part kind of two of that is we also don't have access to the people anymore. So it's like, so it's just one of those things of kind of like, all right, Facebook, we content makers provide you your product for free, basically. You won't let us get in front of everybody without paying. And even if we pay, we don't get in front of everybody, everybody. And we can't get people to come to us so we can sell ads. So you took our people, you took our money, and we're giving you we're cre- we're giving you the stuff you need to have a viable business for free. Right. It's a great time to be Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> you pay nothing to acquire what makes your business go. You've taken all the money from everyone except Google and you can then get paid for publishers to reach some small portion of their audience. Right. Right. And, you you know, know, a lot of people would argue, too, that Facebook as a platform is starting to die off in terms of it's it's the user demographic is aging out as in terms of what do advertisers see to be that kind of juicy center with the highest income and spending power. Right. But that said, I still wouldn't bet against Zuck. I'm sure that, you know, it is going to twist and turn and pivot and adjust uh, as this attention economy, well, they, they, yeah, they have Instagram, which is popular right? with the younger crowd, which is good for if you're meta. Um, and here's the other thing people forget: old people have money. That's what will keep Facebook going long term. Is as people get older, there there will be money there, and so the and the, the nature of the ads will change. It won't be the hot new stuff, but it will, st- you know, it'll probably it'll go into more high ticket items and <clears throat> all this type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're you're gonna end up. You know, there's gonna be a huge pot of money there for the next several decades millennials are hitting their peak earning years they won't retire for another 30 years or so there's going to be a nice well of money there that they can just keep returning to for years yeah yeah well probably launching new stuff as well or tweaking the platform i mean we can already see oh i have no doubt long form content is just it's you know it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter and now we're in the age of the TikTok attention span, and uh, you know, average user on TikTok is consuming an hour and forty-five oh. minutes a day of very <laughs> short-form content. And now you're seeing the traction of YouTube Shorts, and most of the time that people spend on Instagram 
is with either stories or reels, like the static posts and the longer stuff is just kind of dying out on that platform. So it, it, it's interesting to see the direction that it's going and uh, just how it keeps getting more and more compressed as time goes on. You know, as we, this is the perpetuation of like the ADHD nation. You know, can't, <laughs> yes. can't, can't go, can't go, can't go deep on anything. It's just uh, on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. Um, it's yeah. I'm, Which I'm, is I'm, funny because TikTok is launching TikTok. thirty minute videos. Right, they're they're, going, they're actually trying to get the content to be longer. And and what would your prediction be in regards to that being something that's going to be successful or fall flat or something? No, it's between. going it's going to fall flat, and I'll tell you why. Um, people do not want to watch vertical video for that long. Vertical video lends itself to the short form content sort of thing. If it's if you're going to do something long form like that, it's going to be horizontal and people need to be more comfortable watching it. No one's you're not going to hold your phone in your hand monotasking for 30 minutes. See, TikTok's advantage is that it keeps it keeps moving. You swipe it's short, you swipe to the next thing. It's a moving dynamic sort of thing. So you're you're really multitasking. You're doing two things. You're watching and you're swiping. Whereas with a 30 minute video, you're watching and not doing anything else. This is why YouTube is so great because you can have it on another device. You can have it on in the background. You can have right. it on a laptop, on a TV, all this type of thing. I think TikTok's going to find those 30 minute videos don't go. Their plat that's not what their platform does well. Right. Right. Well, I I just don't think it's where the demand is trending. You know, I think that short form is here at least for a while. And we just have to buckle up and get used to it. As a parent, I find it super concerning because it it, it really is just perpetuating this this on to the next, on to the next type of attitude, and never really going deep on anything. Uh, have you heard of this newer company? Well, newer in the U.S. It's a Chinese company called Real Short. Have you heard of this one? I have not yet. Okay, so this is getting a ton of traction in China, and I believe it's been in the U.S. app stores on Google Play and the Apple App Store for about six months, and it is already at, I believe, like 22 or $24 million in revenue. And it is scripted, episodic, short form content in portrait mode. So think oh. like a little soap opera, except each episode is between a minute and a half and two minutes. And, uh, you know, like a good crack dealer does, they'll give you the first few doses free. And then all of a sudden you hit a paywall and it says, oh, are you, are you, are you sucked into this? Well, if you put in your credit card and buy like the next five episodes for $8 or whatever it is, or you just want to subscribe to the service, then you can get all of these. And so it's actual scripted content um, that is really meant to hook people and it's already taking off in the US. So again, even, even like you, you have like the Netflix concept of all of this original content uh, being push through a streaming service, except make it make it portrait mode, make it mobile first and keep it under two minutes and you have a, a whole new content platform. No, that you know that reminds me people on <clears throat> on Instagram especially um have tried doing this before and I've always been surprised it never took off. Several years ago and it was several years because she was still married to Kanye West, Kim Kardashian made a 15-minute movie in Instagram reels oh. in, in oh, her yeah. story, which it was kind of weird and innovative, but it was this whole kind of story. And it was all, it was just shot in their phones in a hotel, all these different right. scenes that all lined up together, all this type of thing. Um, and uh, and it was it was really kind of interesting because it was this whole like mini movie that you watched in Instagram stories. It reminds me of, of that, which was kind of weird and funny, but it, it was incredibly popular. And I, I wondered at the time, why has no one done that? Yeah. I think for Instagram, you know? it wasn't yet. Yeah. There, there has to be like when you're. But when you you're need out, a platform that lends itself to it, of it, course. It, exactly, exactly. When you're saying like, what's you know, what's the most difficult part about publishing an app? It's like, well, getting users, and you know that concept you could wrap up in this term, uh, PMF or product market fit, right? And it's kind of the mm. holy grail for any entrepreneur launching anything. 
And there's a certain expectation that a user has when they get on a certain platform. So it's got to be right content for that platform. So you know, something that she did that if that was on this other platform, Real Shorts, and people are expecting that type of arc with the content and it hits, then it's going to go really, really well. If they're not really expecting that, and there's this, this, this kind of like, you know, cognitive dissonance of like, oh, what this, you know, something I do kind of like this, and this is kind of catchy, but this isn't the place where I'm supposed to have that experience. And then it, it, it falls flat. So of course, that's, yeah. that's, that's the whole product market fit thing. Oh, and I mean, so with vouch, for example, um, this 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 guy uh, Jay Chandrasekhar uh, came into our agency when we we're kind of getting this product going. Uh, he made a movie called Super Troopers twenty years ago that turned into this cult classic. He, he debuted at Sundance, crowds went wild. You know, it's like, oh, this is amazing, and then it goes out into theaters, and then the reviewers see it. They're like, this is the worst <laughs> movie ever, and they gave it like a thirty four percent fresh score, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, just crapped all over this thing. Um, and it 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 went on to be this cult classic, did incredibly well, especially for how much it cost to make. And so when he came to us, he was like, Why, why, why are we trusting these strangers like critics and reviewers to tell us what's good? Or even when I go on Amazon and I'm reading the reviews from a pro, I don't know these people. Like, I don't even know if they're real or if they're fake reviews. Same thing with Yelp, same thing with TripAdvisor, you know, and on and on. And so, you know, he becomes he becomes one of our co-founders for this product. And, uh, you know, getting back to this product market fit, you have somebody who's still actively working in Hollywood, went on to make a bunch of other cult classic movies like Beer Fest, and then worked on the production of the TV show Arrested Development, and then had a, a movie last summer with uh, Joe Coy, the up-and-coming Filipino comedian called uh, Easter Sunday. And so he's got a really good following of these rabid fans. And we're like, awesome. We have Jay on board. You know, he puts out some Instagram reels, talks about the product. We immediately pick up like you know, 12,000 installs, users on this product. And we're looking at the engagement metrics and we're like, huh, why isn't anything really happening? And that's because the only thing that a public figure or famous person's audience usually has in common with each other is they like that person <laughs> or their work yeah, or yeah. movies, but they don't really have anything else in common, you know? And so we had to pivot again and start asking like, well, you know, these other tough questions like, well, you know, what, 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 what is, what is, what is not just a nice to have, but what's a real pain point for an audience when it comes to recommendations. And we landed on, on parents, especially new parents kind of being thrown out into the wild and having to go on Amazon and look at a car seat and decide which one was the best and the safest based on the stranger's reviews you know, and recommendations. Like it'd be great just to ask the other parent what they decided on after they did seven hours of research and actually tried the thing. Just tell me what to get. Tell me what to get. So, you know, we did that again. And then once we did that, of course, engagement went way up because we got much, much closer to this product market fit. So it's not just the audience, but it's what that audience's expectations happen to be on that platform and what that alignment looks like. Well, yes. <clears throat> and I feel like a lot of those platforms, you know, a small percentage of users are going to contribute most of the content, um, you know, and, and so you, you kind of, you know, you need honestly boring people like my dad who's always happy to share it because he's done the thing and he knows a guy and all like you need 20 of those to make like a recommendations platform work, you know? Um, Do you see those super users on platforms like Yelp and TripAdvisor and how many different reviews mm. they put up? Like they really, really get into it. They, you know, be, it becomes this, 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 this passion, right? But the problem being, I don't, I don't, I don't know that person, you know, it's not a, it's not a friend of mine. So our, our whole thesis is kind of taking the power away from a, a blind recommendation and you follow the people whose tastes you trust. Or if I happen to be looking at, at, at your profile, Cameron, and I'm like, oh, wow, I actually love, uh, you know, 17 out of the 20 books that Cameron's recommended. Maybe maybe not Mein Kampf. I haven't read it yet. But, you know, I, I see that and I'm like, okay, 
I'm going to look at some of the other, maybe we also have similar tastes in movies. And then I'd look at some of the movies you recommend. And uh, maybe I look at one of the restaurants that you went to that you loved and I'm like, oh, you know what? I've been there and I love that too. And all of a sudden I found my doppelganger on the other side of the country and I follow you because we have similar tastes. Well, so it, it, it is a matter of taste. It is a matter of taste and lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I have to say though, I am sad that the age of the newspaper and the TV film review is kind of dying out like yeah. i mean because people forget until the internet came along a movie could be sunk or do tremendously well based upon its re its newspaper reviews totally if the new york i mean on broadway if the new york times says your play sucks you're closed the next weekend you're oh. done you got you, you know. got two thumbs down th two thumbs down from siskel and ebert Ugh. done man that's your film out of theaters movie. and on vhs <laughs> in six weeks um and that and that's really the way it used to be and it was a very much of a crowd mentality um you know yeah you had a handful of newspapers you know dallas morning news new york times boston globe san francisco chronicle and those you know if you could you know if, if you didn't get at least one or two of those to say your thing was great it was kind of dead in the water um, right. And at the local level, those newspapers had in sway, you know, if 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 they review your play and they don't like it, that's the end of your play, you know, sort of thing. Um, and uh, and that that system really has gone, you know, um, same thing in the book world. New York Times review of books minted bestsellers for decades. You know, if you got a review there and it was good, that was for writers, that was your whole career. Really yeah. and truly, that was your whole career, and uh, and that whole system is gone now. Gone. It's just gone. It's, it's 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 evolved and it's super fragmented. That's for sure. I I get almost every book on my list from podcasts. You know, I hear somebody talking on a podcast. Some question comes well, that's up. That's great news if you've been a guest on this reading. podcast. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's you know, and it, it and it's not even specific to. Oh, this is uh, you know a business podcast, or this is a lifestyle podcast, or it's 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 anybody who has any sort of deep interest in anything, or maybe even just something they're currently obsessed with and reading about, they tend to talk about it, or the topic comes up, and the host will ask like, "Hey, wow, you're a, an amazing marketer. Like, what books shape the way that you think about marketing?" And then. You know, I'm uh, as the listener. I'm thinking, oh wow, you are an ama amazing marketer. I'm <laughs> waiting for that answer, and I, I, I jot it down as soon as I hear it. And uh, you know, my personal philosophy is, uh, I just buy every book I hear of that sounds even slightly interesting, and I'll, I'll I'll give it, I'll give it four or five chapters. And if I abandon it, that's fine. Those you know, a twelve or fifteen dollar Kindle loss. But if I extract even one meaningful thing out of it, a hundred percent worth that money, right? So I just I hear those on podcasts and I'm I'm just on I'm on the Kindle store <laughs> just 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 buying it on the spot based on that guest recommendation. No, no, I no I think there I think there's I mean I know a lot of people from this podcast have discovered books especially I've done a lot of business and leadership this year. Um last year but this year as well. Um where people have definitely done that there have been some really great uh you know interesting memoirs people telling their stories people writing fiction based upon their stories all this type of thing and i think i think it really be is that personal connection which is why i tell writers that's how you build an audience you know um yeah. and i tell people i said i've sold books to uber drivers really you know um <laughs> i have you know i've i've sold uh you know i've sold you know books on the street to people um I've given books to people because it really becomes about that personal, that personal connection and yeah. that word of mouth and all this. And word of mouth has always been the biggest seller in books and continues to be the biggest seller in books. Um, so the sooner you can get that going, the better off, um, the better off you are. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like podcasting is almost a new word of mouth uh, as more and more people are working from home and seem to be socializing less in person, even though I'm trying to completely change that for myself this upcoming year. 
But I, I think one of the beautiful things about podcasts is that, like you said with YouTube, you'll play something in the background while you're doing something else, right? It's mm-hmm. it's 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 not like you have to, you know, uh, it's not like reading a newspaper or it's not like watching a specific piece of content where your attention has to be on it. You can listen to a podcast while you are driving, while you're walking somewhere, while you're exercising, while you're folding your laundry, you're doing dishes, like anything. And the whole time you're doing that, you're building a kind of intimacy that I really think is hard to replicate any other way through this medium of audio. It's, it's, it's very, very different that connection or even that yeah, parasocial connection you can build with. No, a I, I always tell anyway. people, I said, you know, take me to work with you. Um, you know, you know, the, uh, I'm great for a commute, um, either one long or two short, you know, sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I've always uh, kept around, you know, the 45 minute mark. So it's like, I'm long, but not too long. A lot of people go a lot longer, hour and a half. I've been on some of those shows, um, where, you know, hour and a half, two hours sort of thing. I think that's a little excessive, personally speaking. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it is, I, I agree. I think, and I think that's, you know, but I mean, I, I came from terrestrial radio. So I started on 710K in US and Denver, and I was at 1310K FKA in Greeley, um, your Northern Colorado news leader. And, uh, and, and that was, you know, there were, that was the relationship people had with radio hosts. There was a great radio host years and years ago. I ended up working for his son, um, Justin Sasso at 1310 KFKA, his father, um, Ken Sasso, um, was the former police chief of the city of New Orleans. And he had a radio show in Denver. And I could listen to Ken Sasso tell stories and talk for hours and hours. When I was in high school, he was on from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. And I didn't go to bed before 101 p.m. for years. And uh, it was my parents were very happy when they moved his show down to 7 p.m. because it meant I actually went to bed a decent hour <laughs> um, because it, I mean, it was just I mean, and, and it was and his show was a show about nothing. He did not have a shtick. He just showed up. And started talking about stuff. Um, yeah. And he had, you know, people would, he did a little bit of call in. There was this one young dude in New Mexico, because in Colorado at night, the ionosphere goes away and you can hear AM radio in New Mexico. And you can hear it as far as Utah. And uh, there was this one kid in New Mexico that was, you know, really struggling to get on his feet and figure out his life. And like the, the radio and the listeners and Ken like help this kid get his life together over the show and there was kind of this cool little community when ken died i think in 2006 or 7 12,000 people showed up all of the people who listened to the show for years and years and years because ken was a friend i mean he was throughout through the radio he was our friend through the radio you know and i got i was so lucky to get to work for his son you know for a couple years and all this type of thing and i said you know yeah you're your dad was a friend to so many people and it was just so enthralling and radio was like that, especially at the local level, the local DJs, the local personalities, they were friends, they were people, they were people you had connection to. And, you know, radio is all but gone. Um, And podcasting has come in to fill that void. And, And we get to build these wonderful relationships with people and they listen along to have these discussions. And especially for me, I love taking my listeners on an exploration. I don't, I'm not slavishly tied to any format. My niche is that I don't have one. Um, and so we explore, you know, and I've had on everyone from my mom to talk about presidential elections to the That's former awesome. CEO of Goodyear Tire, you know. Yeah. Um, I've I've interviewed porn stars. Um, I've interviewed uh political criminals on this show um as time has gone on um so we just explore you know and and just kind of wander the world and the country and see what we can come up with well it's so interesting you mentioned terrestrial radio and this format of not really having a format of just having a conversation 
and how that just, it still works today when you, I mean, arguably the most successful podcast on the planet, the Joe Rogan experience is exactly yeah. that. There's no, sure. there it's, it's having a conversation yeah. has a buddy on or somebody with Elon Musk. He probably doesn't have a single question written down. He just starts talking to him or lights up a joint for him or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever yeah. is going to, whatever is going to happen that time. But yeah, you, you, you mentioned these incredibly long episodes that can go. And I, I remember somebody telling me about that podcast and I had to drive uh, home to Los Angeles from San Francisco. And I remember thinking, oh, I'll try listening to this podcast. And I remember getting almost all the way home and I listened to one episode. You know, it's absolutely, absolutely wild. Uh, but yeah, there is, there's, there, there's something, there's, there's some really interesting human trait. And I don't know if it's a, like a, a, a voyeuristic type thing where you almost feel like you're, you're, you're like eavesdropping on somebody's conversation. You're, you're this fly on the wall, just listening to an organic conversation about an interesting topic. And that's, that's that's really cool that there's still a space for that to happen. No, I mean, I, I it's, it's kind of funny in in all the years I've kind of watched podcasting, kind of struggle to find its stride, and then finally really find its stride. Like I remember when like I had an iPod in high school, and you would download them from iTunes onto right. your iPod and take them with you podcasting. Um, and there weren't that many shows, not many people did it. Um, sometimes it was audio of TV stuff, all this type of thing. It no one really took it seriously. That's like in 2004. Yeah. Then, um, I started my very first podcast in 2013. And even by that time, no one really knew what a podcast was. I was explaining to people like, here I am on YouTube. I also podcast. And I would literally take people's phones and show them what a podcast where their podcasting app was. And right. here I am, all this type of thing. I came back to this business in 2018. And that's this is the difference five years makes. When I came back to this business in 2018, I've never had to explain to someone what the podcast is. Okay. I just say, oh yeah, the Cameron Joel podcast and people in, you know, go to cameronjoel.com slash podcast. You have 11, there's 11 audio services, all this type of thing. And people are off and running. It's not a problem. Um, and, and so in, in the 15 years, almost 20 years now, this, that podcasting has been with us. Um, it's taken its time to get its stride, but now it really has just really gone for it. And now you have so many options and so many shows and all this type of thing, even though the stats are rather sad. Most don't make it past episode three and the, right. the handful of shows that are actually active are comparatively small, but that's fine with me. Less competition. Um, so, um, what, is that, what is that stat? It's something like you're in the top 1% if you've made more than 10 episodes. Yes. Like 99% correct. of people who start a podcast never get past episode 10. Yes. And we're recording this wild. on the 11th when of you... December and I have 186 episodes. By the time this comes out, we'll be well over 200. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, yeah, you know, I, it, in the elite few, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Right. Right. And it, um, it's, it, it's kind of like so much, I'd say, especially in this game of content and digital content, so much of it is just staying the course. It's showing up. Right. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because like, I, as you mentioned, oh, you know, less competition, but then you look at the actual podcast listings, you're like, wow, there are <laughs> tons and tons and tons that also make it past 10 and also do pretty well. And you have this just huge chunk in the middle that are kind of floating there. And it's, 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 it's just amazing what you can do in this game by just staying the course. You know, if you if you stay the course, if you show up, if you do it consistently, you've already done so much better than so many people. And it's uh I, I don't know. I just I just see that across the board in so many of these entrepreneurial ventures, right? Just if you if you if you yeah. do the thing that you said you were gonna do and you keep doing it, that is you're you 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 that's half the battle right there. Just keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes. I mean, I, I think the frustrating part for me 
is on the one hand, there's so much more opportunity now, but on the other hand, there's much less opportunity to get paid, to build a career, to build a life, um, to be able to do this in a sustainable way. Um, I was doing my bookkeeping this morning. Can you tell? Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, Did you just wrap up your end of year taxes? What's going on, Cameron? <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, I was doing the books for end of year. That's why I did was doing the books this morning. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there used to be a, a system to grow. That was one of the great things about radio. It was ad supported. There was a system to grow, you know, and there was a system to get paid, you know, for this and to get paid while you grew and got experience and develop that relationship with the listener and all this type of thing. And so while we have this democratization of opportunity in making stuff, the business model isn't really there anymore. Well, um, not that business model, right? It's just, it's become fragmented and it's evolved. It's just different now. I mean, I'd argue that there's more opportunities to make money now than there were back then because you have so many different ways you could monetize or, or or you just generally have more opportunities to be able to sell a, uh, a, a good product or service than you did back then. And I mean, the example I always use, yeah. I, so I, I was just, I was just at this, this, this meetup and I was the oldest one there by a long shot, like embarrassingly older than everybody there. But yeah, upside was I'd done 10 times more things than any of these kids that were there. And so I got a bunch of questions and a lot of them shockingly were still very anti I'm going to make content or I'm going to really make an effort on social media, or I'm not really going to try that hard to craft my own personal brand and have any reach. And I think I said probably five times that evening, you know what? If I had a time machine and I could go back 10 years, I'll tell you the one thing I would do different. I wouldn't have said the things that you're saying today. Like, oh, this is these are just corrupt platforms. It's all bullshit. You can't win. There's no opportunity. It's all saturated. And instead, I would have just shown up and done the work and done it consistently over the last 10 years because some of the most amazing businesses and opportunities that I'm seeing today are so so simple so 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 simple in the concept not not easy i'll say that but but simple and that that simplicity is you 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 create value add content you show up every day and you keep creating it and you grow an interested audience that likes your content that's getting value from you and then when the time comes for you to sell something regardless of what that is, maybe it is paid content, maybe it's a course, maybe it's a product, maybe it's some clothing line you came out with, doesn't, doesn't matter what it is, you now have a channel, like you have a channel. You can literally flip a switch and you 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 have a channel. Uh, these, these, these two guys from the podcast, My First Million, uh, Sam Parr and Sean Puri, I, I've now watched them do this over and over and over again. And it's 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 incredible and it makes me wish i had that time machine but for the longest time i don't know 4 years 5 years that they've had this podcast now they've been like growing it and growing it and growing it eventually became part of the hubspot podcast network it got even bigger both these guys were serial entrepreneurs they both had pretty good exits and would just talk about business stuff and have guests on that talked about business stuff and entrepreneurial stuff. And they just scheme on ideas and marketing ideas. And hey, have you heard of this company and this app? And wow, this is incredible. Look what they did. Just super entertaining, but a lot of value add for people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Then all of a sudden one day, uh, Sean says, hey, I found this, this, this company where you know, instead of trying to hire these super expensive resources in the US, they have boots on the ground in locations around the world, like the Philippines and in Colombia and in Argentina. And you can get these people for pennies on the dollar, which you'd pay in the US, but they set everything up for you and they're fully vetted. You don't have to worry about being scammed. And it's 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 incredible. I loved it so much that I invested in this company. 
and uh, I've got a discount for you guys. And he had a pretty good stake in the company. And in the last six months, I believe, I've heard they've tripled their business. And the only thing that they did different was have Sean talk about it on the podcast. The other guy, the other guy, Sam, he saw this white space in the market for starting a network of entrepreneurs that were over a certain amount of revenue and experience, but felt a little bit isolated, that they they didn't really feel like they belonged in a, a YPO or the Young's President's Organization type thing, which, listen, you could just be a, a C-suite executive for a pretty big company and you're in there. It doesn't necessarily mean you started anything or went through those hardships and trials and tribulations. You were just in this position and had this amount of wealth now. Or there was EO that was more for entrepreneurs, but kind of diluted and not very exclusive or curated. So he launched this one called Hampton and a uh, very, very selective, but you got put in these little cohorts of other entrepreneurs that not only matched your skill set or your area of interest, but they're at varying levels of your business. The idea being that you, you'd help each other and have these resources and this camaraderie. Um, that thing, you know, first the the first round of it completely filled up. Um, I just got in the the second round by the skin of my teeth. Uh, and you know, these aren't like inexpensive things to be a part of, but they just flipped the switch. They had the audience. And that that opportunity with granted enough patience and perseverance is available to almost anybody who wants to do it. Doesn't matter what job you've had, doesn't matter what college you went to, doesn't matter your experience. Like anybody, anybody can like start doing this today. It's wild. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of frustration because for every one of those, there's probably 10 more people who are struggling and can't do that. More, I'd say more um, than 10. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just, yes. I mean, I, I, I think- I More think, than 10, right? <laughs> yeah, one of the, there's a piece coming out on the camera, Joel, this one's talking about the create the creator economy has no middle class. And studies have shown, you know, if you're in the top 10% of creators, the, you know, Logan Paul, Jake Paul, Mr. Beast, all this type of thing, um, right. you're doing very well and you can do that. And there's kind of a, a a group in echelon up there, you know, that and a little bit down from that, you know, like I said, top about 10%, you can get away with that. After that first 10%, things fall off fast. Right. Um, and things there's really no kind of muddily middle middle class people that are doing okay, that are kind of making it, but aren't doing that great, and all this type of thing. And one of the one of the chief problems is, and I think why that meetup you went to why people are complaining about this with platforms, is the platforms have sucked up all the money. You know, and this right. is even true for TikTok that's trying to do the, you know, creator monetizing share, but especially down at meta and Google and um, uh, I guess less so X because Elon's trying to do a monetization sharing thing and all this type of thing. Um, and, and what we also have um, like the, the exclusive, the exclusive connects for people who want to see content that isn't being published to everybody on X, but you can see this exclusive content and you can also have direct access to that content publisher if you pay the, I think it's like 29 bucks a month to be part of. Yeah, and there's also, content. you know, depending on how much your stuff is viewed, you get part of the ad revenue, which is right. a, 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 honestly a system. It would be nice to see Meta move towards something like that, especially for content publishers, which right. um, Facebook has tried to do a little bit of, is forced to do in Australia by court order um, because Facebook was screwing over all the local, you know, news in Australia. Um, all this type of thing. You know, they really are, even, even their attempts to spread the wealth still advantage those people, you know, with the large reach, with the large accounts, all this type of thing. The algorithms tend to favor them, all this type sure. of thing. So it's kind you kind of have this platform system which advantages those who already have the tremendous reach. And I will say, barring paying for it, 
I've never figured out how some of these accounts come out of nowhere to get a couple million likes. Like, you'll just see different people come along and they are, and I've watched it. I'll find somebody who maybe has 50,000 followers and then something happens, never ever quite figured out what it is. And then all of a sudden they're off to the camp town races, you know? Um, and again, barring paying for it, which I presume some people are doing, um, yeah. it, it never, it's always has been a mystery to me how that, how that happens. Um, especially as someone like myself, who's put out a content in volume, you know, I produce eight to 10 shorts a week. We have interviews at least once a week. I usually do the news hour when it's not the holidays, all this type of thing, plus written content of 30 to 40 pieces a month. It's not like there isn't a lot of material. Haven't really ever got there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, th I, think, I think a lot um, of people, especially if you're on a social only play, I think are very frustrated by that fact that it, it doesn't, you know, the... The, the you know there's kind of a um esoteric mystery behind all of that well i think there's a big difference too between uh you know i i forget what the percentage is right now but they you know they go out and they ask like elementary school age kids you know what's your what's your what's your dream job and i think it was in, in 1971 is something like 80 percent of kids said they want to be astronauts right yes. yes and now close to that same percentage say they want to be youtubers yes right yeah. <laughs> content creators and I think there is a big difference between like chasing that YouTube money, right? Trying to trying to trying to get trying to get like ad money from you know back to the attention economy. Uh, of course, yeah. I'm going to create content that ads can run against, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get Jake Paul money from YouTube ads, right? right. Versus this 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 long play of I'm going to commit to providing as much value as I can to a very specific audience for as long as I can until I build that audience up and build that trust to a point where it now becomes a channel for whatever product, good or service I want to put through that channel. You know, something that I'm creating, not selling the attention of those people to the advertisers. So I, th I think those are different strategies. And I think a lot of these like seemingly overnight successes, I totally agree. There's some weird spooky stuff out there where You'll see somebody who didn't seem like they're ever around before and all of a sudden hit some inflection point where they have a crazy audience size. And you think like, how the hell did that happen? But I think more often it's just the 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 unseen grind of of doing this year after year after year of just of just staying at it. And then uh it's kind of like the breakout band, right? That oh wow this was a, it was an it was an overnight success and these guys came out of nowhere and now they got signed on this label and they're going on tour and you didn't see you didn't see the nine years of playing shitty dive bars with nobody in the audience over and over and over like just doing those reps doing those reps so I I, I you know I'm 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 not saying that doesn't happen but at the same time I think it's much more likely that we don't get to see the before we only get to see the after you know when they come to us when they get on our radar they've already got these massive followings and the house in the hills with the pool and the the lamborghini no, no, i mean there's blah, blah, there, blah. yeah there was a i was a channel i follow on youtube that um is uh is a is very entertaining comedy channel i love comedy and stand comedy and and she talks about you know the the journey her and her husband went through to get to this place and they finally have you know a channel that is huge and all this type of thing and and they were working as content creators for a mini split company for eight years you know they did that for a long time and and cut their teeth on that and she said it's been a 15 you know it's really been a 15 year journey um and uh and that and i agree i mean i uploaded my first youtube video in 2013 with the Cameron Cowan show. In fact, I just uploaded all the archives of that to my new YouTube channel. Um, and uh, and it has, I mean, the difference between what I did in 2013 and what I did when I started back again in 2019 was huge. You know, not only had the ecosystem changed, but I was older, wiser, kind of knew what to do this time around and changed a lot. Um, yeah, I just think it's, I think people are frustrated by the fact that you're, there's two groups, you're either doing very, very well or you're barely on anybody's radar. There doesn't seem right. to really be 
be a middle. And I, I guess it, it's amazing to watch, especially like there's a kind of a, a YouTube genre of like couples YouTube channels. And some of them I've, and I've seen this happen. I've caught a couple of them early, sub hundred thousand. And, and they hit that point and they, and then it's just, you know, then it's kind of straight up from there. Um, and I, I think that's where people are kind of a bit, a bit frustrated, but I think I agree with you developing your own audience, creating your own product, owning your own rails, which has always right. been my method is vital. I think it's really hard if you're depending on these platforms to feed you. Yeah, for um, sure. Because you're always going to be subject to their whims. If you right. really want to be able to play this long term, you have to own your own rails somewhere, you know. And I'm very happy that my website is my biggest platform because I own that, you know. Um, I, I've lost a lot of traffic from Twitter this year because of the platform changes. Um, and it's hurt. I won't say it hasn't. But it's not the end of me, right. you know. Even though Twitter is my largest platform, it's not the end of me. Um, right. But I mean, I also wish brands would be willing to engage with other non-social platforms as well. My biggest platforms are the two platforms brands don't want to engage with. Brands want to be on Instagram. They want to be on TikTok. That's not where my audience is. Um, and so that is kind of a frustrating thing as well when you're trying to monetize and all this type of thing. And so, I, and I think that's where people's frustration comes from is... You know, you can really, you know, really do something, really have something. And if it's kind of not in this very narrow thing and box and whatnot, it kind of ends up not mattering, which is kind of weird. And right. that I think is also a frustration as well. But I agree with you on the yeah, for sure. Folks. For sure. I mean, there are absolutely shortcuts out there. And I think that there are absolutely more cases than not of people just being impatient. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't want to go hungry for X number of years and put in the work. And, you know, the hard part about trying to figure out what's going to happen next is that you don't know and nobody knows. And it yeah. seems like nothing's happening until everything's happening. Right. And you say, oh, it's been seven years. And I just feel like oh, still struggling and nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, all that seven years of work pays off the next year. Then year eight, everything happens and you're more than fed and you're doing very, very well. And you know now all these other opportunities open up that you would have never seen coming the year before. And it's just that, that grit, that, per, that, that perseverance. But yeah, you know, then you you also have some of the shortcuts might be timing, right? Right time, right place. You you talk about, you know, Jake Paul, Logan Paul moving to West LA during a time when YouTube is just exploding and coming into it with this strategy, like knowing exactly where to move and 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 where to live, and then people seeing the meteoric rise of them. And somehow recognizing in footage, I don't, know, I don't know if you've heard this story, like figuring out like the apartment complex that a bunch of these YouTubers were living in, in Hollywood. Yeah. And strategically moving, like figuring that out, moving there, finding finding out where they are and then uh, serendipitously bumping into them at the local gym and befriending them and then collaborating and, you know really, really going out of their way for these crazy strategies, taking these moonshots that then end up working and propelling them into the stratosphere of, of, of the known versus the unknown in the content game, right? Or you have other guys like uh, Alex Hermosi, who kind of like me ignored social media and all these platforms and content for the last decade, and then all of a sudden decided it matters. And uh, totally off the radar is just making all this content for years and years, like last five years, and nobody's watching and nobody, nobody's nobody's heard of him. And then gets to this point where all of a sudden it breaks through. And then he really opens up the spigot and he hires a content production team and starts doing you know, paid spend behind all this stuff and putting out like 120 pieces of content a week and spending $130,000 a month in post for video. And all of a sudden, if 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 you are in the business of starting businesses, if you are an entrepreneur and you're on 
any one of these platforms, doesn't matter what it is, YouTube, Snap, TikTok, Instagram, he's just in your face everywhere. He's seemingly everywhere. And it seems like it happened overnight, but it wasn't only five years in the making. It was like investing a ton of personal capital behind the effort too. So there's 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 like all these paths that end up at the same place and at varying levels. But I, I don't think you necessarily have to be at the top, top, top to be able to make a really good living if that consistency there and there's a well thought out plan to do it. I, I've been thinking about uh, about you, Cameron, and, and how you talk so much about these different books and about being an author and 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 what makes a good writer. And you know, who knows, like that starts to be the audience that you curate over time and then you develop the course that makes everybody a better writer for that uh, that 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 person who wants to finally step out and do this and write something and then you sell that course to this specific niche audience and it doesn't matter if your followers in the millions you know if they're in the tens of thousands like you have a very legitimate business right there no 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 new course coming 2024 um Boom, I called it see yeah yes the power of story um i yeah, I, I did a prototype for it um, for my MFA and people really were into it because it's very soup to nuts, you know, and it's very, here's all the things that they don't tell you and here's all the, you know, kind of questions the answer, you know, all this type of thing. Um, and no, I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely uh, agree. It's just, yeah, it's, it's definitely been, um, been a, been a struggle. Um, and I'm, luckier than a lot of people in terms of I've had some, you know, some things, you know, some things happen. Um, you know, I have played the Google game well and been able to, you know, rank content, rank the site, all this type of thing, you know, play the SEO game successfully. Um, I was an early adopter of social media. I've been on Twitter since 2008. Wow. Um, I was on Facebook in like the first few years it was open. I mean, I was a very, I knew what social media was. I saw what was coming. Um, I I just, I was never really able to really take advantage of that. Um, I I was building publications and other brands and all this. Stuff, so I never really kind of made it, took advantage of it for my, for myself. Um, and uh, it was a very difficult. It's it's been a very difficult, very, very difficult journey. But the but I, I agree with you. Having developing your own audience and selling to that audience is and and the stuff in the article I've written talks about this um, is definitely the way to kind of create that small, you know, that small, you know, kind of content creator business going. You don't have to be the huge you know, tens of millions of follower account to do something. If you have people who love what you do and are willing to give, you're willing to ask them for small amounts of money, five, 10 bucks, you can do quite well. You know, yeah. if you've got three to 5,000 people and you're giving and you can get five bucks out of them, you're doing quite well. Yeah, um, it's, man, it's a, it is a long game. Like it's a lot of patience unless it you is know, mentioned you parlayed fame from one channel into another channel or you had the pay to play yeah. and could hire fancy PR and get media mentions and all that kind of stuff, or have like the amazing type of like post-production that is engineered to get picked up by algorithms and get you more reach and all of that stuff. Right. It's yeah, there's, there's, there's little jumps that can be made here and there, but man, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long game. And I think like back to that, conversation about how our attention keeps getting compressed, right? We're, we're, we're being trained to go to the next thing, go to the next thing, go to the next thing. Oh, five minute video. You got to be kidding me. I'm used to just seeing something that's, uh, you know, 90 seconds max, right? Yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you think that does to our general demeanor and ambition and planning and willingness to do something for longer, right? To put just you know, no, not just tanks more it. effort, yeah, but no, like a I mean, longer. And we've arc already of time, been right? in a culture of instant gratification thanks to tech anyway, and we've somehow figured out how to make that worse. Um, and no, yeah. and it, it does, it's very hard to say to someone, yeah, this is gonna take years when they're living in a 60, 90 second, you know, no longer than five minutes world. 
And the reality is in business, in life, all this type of thing, things that are quality and last take time. For sure. Um, I think that's one of the things that people have a hard time with writing books. Um, yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. It, it takes about, a very long time. The ultimate, book, the ultimate grind of isolation, right? <laughs> yeah, no, my first, my first book, if you count it from when I first thought of it to when I finished it, my first book took 11 years to write. Um, uh, my first nonfiction book took three years to write. My short story collection uh, was three years. Um, my my next novel, which is a Sweetgrass Saga, I did in grad school and was fairly short at only two years. Um, so, um, yeah, it's um, you know, my my next nonfiction book, America's Lost Generation, has been three years. I started in twenty twenty, and it's 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 in editorial right now. It's done. It's in editorial right now. It took three years. Um, the, in writing, that's a terrible problem because it is a very long time, and I've been working on a lot of these book projects since 2013 and I didn't put my first book out to 2019 didn't have my first novel out to 2020 so even just that period of my life was seven years um didn't have short story collection out till 2020 didn't get my first journal publishing till 2020 I've been writing in some form since 2005 I've just been uploading a lot of my old archives and everything lately um and so uh yeah, it is it is a very difficult it is a very difficult thing. But if you can endure, if you can take the deep breath, it can be very rewarding to yeah. get there. Yeah. I think I think the other part of that that most people really have a hard time getting their heads around this idea of you're you're gonna work but not get paid, right? That yeah. you're working towards something and in that journey you're probably not going to get paid. People are used to clocking in and making X amount per hour, getting that paycheck or going to that office and getting that salary and those benefits. And there's really nothing like that when you're starting this game or even in the early stages or middle or later stages of this game very often, right? You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not going to get paid. You have to architect some kind of life where you're able to feed yourself or take care of others if you have dependents while you're chasing that bigger thing that you want to do. And there's really no way around the fact that that's just a ton of work for most people, a ton of work. No, I mean that I know that in the years that I've taken off to work and whatnot, I write very little. I do very little because by the time I, by the time you work and you housekeep and all this type of thing, there's very little time left in the day and double stuff. You have kids, you know, and I've been a child minder and care for a long time. And I didn't, you know, when I had three girls to get out to school in the morning, I did not, there was not a lot of that going on. Um, right. you know, I think it's, I think it's very hard. I think it's very hard. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really, I think if, I think if anything, post pandemic i think it's really great because now with remote work and all this type of thing you can kind of get some flexibility schedule wise that really helps with that yeah. um and uh yeah i've been i've been on i've i've been kind of working on that myself um and uh having having that flexibility um to you know do that sort of thing. I think that's really, you know, that's really great. And I've, I've enjoyed in the past, I've had clients doing content for them, doing advertising for them in 2021. I did Alaska airlines, the happy planes campaign, the smiling to, we're trying to get people to fly again. Um, right. <laughs> you know, a lot of, you know, and sometimes doing, you know, teaching companies, how to content create. I had a client years ago, they were a gun store and I had to teach a bunch of crusty 40 and 50 year old gun dudes how to use Instagram. And once they got it, they took to it and you couldn't hardly keep, they kept coming up with all these great content ideas. It was hilarious. And their Instagram channel is still fire. I haven't had that client in 10 years and their Instagram is still great. Um, and so, um, so uh, yeah, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. I think the great thing about this is you get a lot of skills that you can leverage in other things. Right. And for other people, even local businesses, all this type of thing, you know, so there's kind of ways to, to, to do that, to kind of make that happen. But I do as much opportunity as there is now. And as much as I'm so grateful for the modern ecosystem that makes the Cameron Journal possible, I do kind of miss the old system because there was like 
money in it. You know, it had a a business model that paid and you could get paid. And as a mid thirties millennial who graduated in a recession and has always struggled in the whole getting paid aspect of life. Um, I, I, and kind of wish I were like 10 years older and could have gotten in on the, on the grip, you know, I, know. I mean, I, I have photography friends that came up in the eighties and nineties that were getting paid $2,000, you know, a shoot to be a photographer's assistant. And I'm like, I'm sorry. They gave you how much money? <laughs> like, right. and it's just because, but because that's because the main photographer was charging $25,000 for a photo shoot. So 2k for the assistant was just a, a fun line item, you know, sort of thing. Um, Yeah. That, you know, that's, that's, I, I, there, I see advantages to both. I see advantages to both. Well, that's back to that, back to that concept of right time, right place, right? Every, every, yeah. every one of, every one of these chapters has some kind of an arc and you that's are so going to be introduced into that arc at some point. And sometimes it's the beginning and you get to write it up and you've already created all your wealth by the time it starts to phase out. Or you come in more towards the middle. It's probably like where where you came into that world, right? And it's always sad to see that 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 legacy framework start to fade away and be replaced by another one, because regardless if you came in the beginning or in the middle of that arc, you had to pay your dues. Like you put work yeah. in to be part of that system and reap the rewards of that system. And then when that system starts to disintegrate, that's sad. Right, like that's. No, I mean, I I kind of caught the tail end of it when I first got into all of this. It was about two thousand four, two thousand five, and print had kind of reached its zenith. Right about then, the internet hadn't really happened for content yet. But then two things would happen: one, broadband would get a lot more popular, and the smartphone arrived three years later, and that killed newspapers magazines all this stuff i mean you know it there was you know i mean the the book business was already under strain from amazon but amazon hadn't really taken over yet that would really start to happen at that time and so uh yeah i mean it was you know i mean we used to hang out in in bookstores and record shops and cd stores and then we had you know pirating and then we had streaming and all of these things and it just the ecosystem yeah. changed to where and and though all those business models don't you know 20 years later don't exist anymore um right. and uh and now we're in this kind of awkward situation where we're trying to make sense of of the new thing and i've you know, I've said this before and I've said this again. Um, I feel like we're we're kind of losing the arts a little bit. And the pandemic didn't help with that. It really damaged but, the arts. Um, but I think most importantly, creative product of itself is no longer going to be what pays the bills. That's already been true in the music industry for about 15 years. I used on a record label. Yeah. yeah. That's not been true for a, for music for a while. Um, in in the in it it was never really true in the book business, but it's getting even less true in in that. Um, the movie business, it kind of was not always true. It's becoming less so. Um, it, it's it's film is going through a difficult time. Yes, yeah, the the creative super what's happening in film, yeah. Yeah, the creative product, I don't, that's not going to be the big moneymaker anymore. It's going to be stuff around it. The stars are already, they're all starting their own makeup brands and this stuff because that's where the money's at. Money's right. not making movies anymore. Oh. You know, um, you know, musicians are always, you know, doing products and touring all this because that's where the money's at. It's not in the music anymore. Um, right. And I, I think for, you know, a lot of us in, this sort of create, you know, this content creator space, all this type of thing, the money is not going to be in the product itself. It's going to be in the stuff around it. It's probably just going to keep changing. Uh, were you there for like the really early days of Napster? Yeah. When when that when that when that came up, and do you remember how, you know, when the music industry really finally got wind of what was going on and how much 
yeah, illegal peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Oh god, they mm -hmm. and they did their level best to kill that too. They oh, really tried. Yeah. They yeah, spent yeah, yeah. shitloads right. trying yeah. to kill it and couldn't ever couldn't yeah. ever do it. That it once that door was opened, it was gone. It's because totally. that was it. Because the, the problem is not only did Napster come along, but you now had devices that could hold lots of music. It, you know. It, it, exactly. But it's the the topic, the topic du jour was lawsuits lawsuits yes. lawsuits hammering lawsuits right trying to trying to shut it down and in hindsight yeah. that's so funny because it was really the precipice of a whole bunch of new opportunities in an industry that had been living it just it you know, fat on the land for decades and decades and decades doing the same oh, old yeah. thing and all of a sudden it's like oh wow what's happening here this has changed and the answer was Let's try to let's try to shut it all down. Let's try to keep the legacy alive. And of course, you know, you're nobody's going to survive that locomotive bearing down on them when they're standing squarely on the tracks of innovation. And right. that's what happened. And then it, you know, like you were talking about the, you know, the early iPods, right? Yeah. Download music. And then all of a sudden it shifted again, streaming. And again, it's just streaming. People were freaking out. Well, how is this going to be monetized? How are people ever going to make money? Have you heard of this artist, uh, Connor Price? He's a yes, a, I have uh, actually. Yeah, hip hop yeah, yeah. artist, white rapper, seemingly yes, yes, yes. out of nowhere. So you know, talk talk about looking at these different platforms and opportunities. Uh, he was working minimum wage jobs, not really going anywhere, but pretty talented. Like actually, really good at his at his at his craft. But again, like you said. It's really hard to get any sort of notice, just become the signal in all this noise and have anything happen. So his wife happened to be a pretty brilliant marketer who had worked for some big brands and was really good on the content side. And they started doing these TikTok shorts where instead of just playing a song on TikTok, they would write a little script and he'd play a bunch of the different parts. Like he'd he'd be, uh, you know, uh, himself, but he'd also be like the producer and he'd be his nerdy twin brother and just yeah. he'd shoot all this stuff. And, that, and that's now become its own it. format. Like there's other that's people who copied it. Format. That's now its own yeah, format. Oh, tons, of people, yeah. tons of people are doing that. But he was one of the people early do that. And these TikToks just started catching fire. No, no paid media behind them. And last I heard, he was doing something like $170,000 a month on Spotify stream payments, right? Yeah. I, I, again, now, there's lots of an little, outlier lots with all of the artists, artists trying to make that, it, but... No, I mean, wow. there's lots of artists that have come out of that and are not necessarily going label route. There's this one called Jake who wrote this song called Golden Hour that has been on television and is in been licensed for TV and all this type of thing. He is totally indie, no label. Um, people forget Justin Bieber got popular on YouTube. Right. He went the label route, but nobody knew who he was. He had a YouTube channel and right. was cute and sang songs like that. Was, like people kind of forget he started. He was he is a product of the internet, really. Right um, time, right time, right place, right. Yes, platform. right time. Yes, I mean because YouTube was a growing platform, and he happened to you know the right kid at the right place with the you know sort of thing. Um, yeah, lo there's lots of you know, th but there's now. I mean, again, there's there's definitely this opportunity to. Do that. Especially in stand-up comedy, there are people who are, you know, back in the day, if you went on to The Tonight Show once, that was your career as a stand-up comic. That's all you had to do was go on yeah. The Tonight Show once, and that was your career for the rest of your life. Nowadays, it's get a TikTok channel, get some yucks on TikTok going, and that also can be your career. And the clubs will book you, and the totally. theaters will book you, I mean, all this type of thing. And you now have this whole new generation of comedians not and I'm and I say generation not by age but by popularity, the new batch coming along who have cut their teeth and become popular on the internet and are now coming up in, in that way in the stand-up comedy scene. Um which also has its own podcast ecosystem, which also has its own, you know, YouTube channel ecosystem, all this type of thing. You know, if you're a comedy nerd like I am, um you know that whole thing there yeah that's it's that has become its own ecosystem yeah its own and, and, it just, and it just it's just going to keep evolving and keep evolving right and yeah. what's around the corner with ai who knows who knows right it's like we're yeah. almost 
in this little window of a mini singularity where we don't we don't we don't know what's what what this is going to look like even a year from now and you, you'd mentioned like oh if a musician makes it on one of these late night shows that's a big break now you're good now you're going to get signed if you hadn't been signed already yeah. and i was thinking i was thinking just the other day about these late night shows and somebody had passed me a clip from conan o'brien of him trying to learn korean from this korean language teacher and yeah. it was hilarious and i'm like oh yeah conan o'brien oh yeah late night shows the only time i ever see any of that is when i see some short on the internet right it's yeah. it's 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 just absolutely wild. Well, but here's thing: Conan Conan being the ever innovator he is, he's now doing Sirius XM. He's now doing a podcast. Yep. He's now doing video stuff. He's left the really the TV. He does a series for HBO Max, Conan Without Borders. But yeah. I mean, he, he's really kind of gone into all this, you know, new media stuff and whatnot. Um, and he's turned his staff into their own quirky personalities to have their own fandom, fan club, all this type of thing. And that's you know. Um, and so, I mean, so it, it, honestly, for, in terms of owning his own stuff, getting fired by the Tonight Show was about the best thing that ever happened. For sure. Because now he has Konico, he owns, he owned his own TBS show, he owned all his own stuff. When you are a host of the Tonight Show, that show's owned by NBC, as it has been since 1951, when Ed Parr was the first host of the Tonight right. Show. Right. NBC owns that. You own nothing. Your talent that's right. Conan, on the other hand, owns all of his own it's shit. Evolving. Yeah. So it's evolving. honestly, if I were him, I would thank Jay Leno every day of my life because yeah. he was able to take what was probably a career crushing situation and he has turned it into a cash cow, you yeah. know, um, and, yeah. and what a tremendous Seeing him just made run. me think of like all those guys that you mentioned, right? Like just yeah. this. This whole era of where we would see this content is just dramatically shifted. Even I saw John Oliver just got another five-year contract with uh, HBO. And I, I, I love his show. And there was a time in my life where I had the bandwidth to watch it when it came out. And I don't now, but I'll see a, I'll, I'll see, I'll see a clip. You know, I'll, I'll see a short. I'll see the short form version and excerpt from that show that makes me want to watch the entire thing again it's just it's just it keeps evolving it keeps changing the distribution keeps changing it's just i don't know yeah. if you're super no i i love it when i do a short and people then go watch the long form stuff yeah um i did a series this year called fashion moves the world and we we had a lot of that um i did i turned that into a bunch of shorts the shorts did very well and the series did better um from from that and and sometimes i'm always surprised of the videos that end up you know really going and doing all the shorts that tend to do really well or whatever have you um is always a point of hilarity hilarity for me right. um you know so it it is um I, I have to say the 60 second youtube shorts it's not a format i necessarily make a lot of content for specifically but it's been very good to me in terms of watch time, audience discovery, um, all this type of thing. Um, and same thing with TikTok. Like that's been good for camera. I have to say that's been one innovation that for once has actually benefited me and gotten me in front of new people and they're watching and they're liking it and enjoying it and all this yeah. type of thing. And that's been rare. Most platform changes are not good for camera, but this one actually has been an improvement. So it's 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 nice but we have gone so far over i only usually sure do 45 have. minutes and we've done 90 this is technically two episodes um stop, stop so oh my goodness so it's why don't you <laughs> <laughs> well why don't why why don't we wrap up this far-ranging conversation why don't you tell us where we can find you online and where we can keep up with you yeah. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, but nobody's ever going to remember how to spell my name. So if you go to sparksix.com, it's S-P-A-R-K, the number six.com, all the links are in the footer right there. And then of course, if you look up Vouch Vault on the Google Play Store or on Apple's uh, iOS marketplace, you will find Vouch. It's 100% free. That's right. We just burn money every month and we'll figure this out someday, but enjoy it while it's there. Uh, it, it is really a great platform. 
to find recommendations. You can get uh, Cameron's reading list on there as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the Cameron Journal podcast. Absolutely, Cameron. It's been my pleasure and an honor. Thank you. That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners. So please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you.